Welcome to The Riff. Today, Jeremy sits down with Colton Beck to walk through his story. Just a warning that the first four minutes of this podcast sounds a bit odd, and after that, it sounds like we push the right button because that's actually what happens. Thanks for listening. Colton Beck, and some of you uh, may know Colton, some of you might uh, know of his story, but we're going to dive in and, and talk a little bit about uh, how, uh, you know, your, your, your journey has shaped your faith, and so welcome, Colton, first time on the show. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm excited to have you. Thanks for being our guest, and welcome to our studio. So, uh, Colton Beck, tell us a little bit about you and your family. Who's the Beck family? Beck family. So uh, my wife Jessica. I got two kids. A uh, boy named Bo. He's eight. Uh, Stella. She's five. Um, wife and I. We got married in uh, July of 2012. So okay. our ten year anniversary is coming up. And it's soon. Jess. Jess. Yep. Jess. Jess. Jessica. Jessica. I call okay. her Jess. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Well, uh, I, should I call her Jess? Yeah. You could. Okay. Okay. Could. Okay. Well, we'll all call her Jess or Jessica. Yeah. Yep. So you've been married for man almost uh, ten years now. Yep. Wow. So that's a big, big uh, accomplish, accomplishment coming up. So we got uh, vacation scheduled, and uh, we actually included the whole family for the vacation this year. But uh, now, you okay, know, have you have you done that before? Like since they were able to talk back to you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's an adventure. Yeah, we went probably three years ago to Florida. Uh, so Bo was was able to, but now we're gonna have two uh, full on kids ready to complain about us yep. taking them somewhere nice. driving flying <laughs> uh driving oh so. it's gonna be perfect yeah. so you know one of the things i like to do when i drive is beat the estimated time yeah i don't think you'll be doing that no <laughs> it never happens so no. it's not just the kids though it's my wife too she has to stop every like 20 miles to go to the restroom so yeah no i uh, we, we we do restroom tours uh, around the, the the nation uh bucky's tours are great mm-hmm. stops so mm-hmm. uh well okay so you got you've got kids uh third grade kindergarten mm-hmm. and uh so let's pull the string even further back uh how where did you grow up i grew up in uh Cassville, missouri the mouth of the roaring river yep is it yeah yep. Yeah, the so, spring, I think they were at one time there was a uh, I think it was just an old story that it used to be the Cassville Trouts. Really? I think it used to be the mascot, but now it's the Wildcats. So okay, so so Cassville, like uh, a class of how many people? How many people would graduate? Uh, probably like when I was going through like 150 to 200 maybe. So it's pretty. That's pretty it's big. bigger than like a small school, but uh, I could be wrong on those numbers too. I didn't really pay attention uh, much, but. Uh, still smaller than what but I you're was. one of them we know that yeah, you graduated I'm one of them and I made it so yeah very good okay so what was life like growing up in Cassville um, I've driven through it um, I've been to the Walmart but I'm not 100% confident what life was like living yeah there. we had like one stoplight in town they've gotten a few since okay. uh, I was growing up so we had like one stoplight in the town but were you a farm kid I mean no I wasn't okay. so there were there are a lot of farm kids there okay. but uh you know, I was more like a sports, you know, kid. That's what I wrapped my, my uh, life into was sports. So, um, you know. Well, what did you play? I played football and baseball. Okay. You uh, good? I was all right. All right. I'm not. I didn't go play anywhere. So you still like got that, some college eligibility left? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, if you can redshirt me, too, and give me a chance to get back in my shape. Hey, with NIL, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it could happen. Yeah. So, okay, so I grew up in Castle. Um and uh do you have a faith background growing up so yes i did so um my faith background would have started probably with my great grandmother so she lived in a town close to castle called eagle rock and uh she went to a i believe it was a it's not really bad at this i think it was a methodist uh style church uh but we went we would go there every off so often growing up like yeah you know my mom would load us up and we'd go to grandma meet grandma church because yeah. she wanted us there she was in the choir or stuff like that so that was when it really started and then uh my father's parents started taking me regularly um in a small little it's called mount olive baptist church okay and, like the hills of cassville like the outer outskirts of cassville small church um and that was when you know, started getting things built, built into my heart to, to prepare me for uh, 
uh, being saved. So that's where I was saved and baptized was at Little Mount Olive Baptist Church. Really? So, yeah, I was probably, I think I was 12, uh, November, November of the year I was 12. So, wow. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, now you still have family back there? Yeah. I was my grandparents, uh, my father, uh, my sister. Um, so, yeah. Family, okay. Family visit down there. I got reasons to go down back. So. Now, how did you meet Jess? So, Jess, uh, her father was uh, an administrator at my high school uh, when I was in high school. So, he had Jessica, then he had uh, Aaron, her brother, who was a year older than me. So, okay. I kind of played sports with him. Okay. And then he, they have a younger daughter um, that was at that time grade school. But, uh, so fast forward to graduated high school, uh, started going to college locally there at the community college in Cassville, and then uh, I worked at Walmart in Cassville. So I know exactly where it is. Working at Walmart, yeah. you know, going to college, and she came through my line as a cashier. So she. Came so you were checking her out. I mean, like like uh, professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like professional. <laughs> okay, like okay. Yeah, let me check you out. I mean, so um, she. Uh, went through my line and her parent, her family's really known for like her dad's like, he eats like a rabbit. He's like a very health, healthy guy. Okay. Runs ultra marathon, stuff like wow. that. So when she came through my line, she made the comment like, this isn't your regular, her maiden name's Jameson. This isn't your regular Jameson uh, shopping list. And it was like potato chips, Rice Krispie Treat cereal, French onion dip, um, and some like snacks. And I was like, hey, I said, it doesn't look like it's showing on you, so I I would keep eating that way, and uh, so that was like my little. So. Now, time out. If you're listening out there as a single person, <laughs> that should be a hallmark line right there. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't look like it's showing. Yeah, that's good. Okay, yeah, so, and it worked. Yeah, it worked. So she reached out to me like, uh, yeah, the cereal, the 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 cereal topic. Uh, was what she approached me with. She said, hey, like two days later, she messaged me through Facebook and said, hey, uh, you'd be uh, surprised, but I've finished that bo box of cereal I bought. And I was said, <sighs> impressive. I said, that's my kind of girl right there. She likes cereal. So uh, she, uh, <laughs> we started talking about cereal and then, you know, one thing leads to another. We, well, as a, for we, sure it does, um, yeah. So anyways, that was, that was our, the fire lighting you know, wow. event. So, but before that, I thought she hated me. I've seen her around, yeah, and she just had one of those faces. It looks like she just does can't stand you. You know, uh, so I was kind of more scared of her than anything. But yeah, I that time I gave it a chance. So good it worked out. Okay, and so and here you are, two kids later, ten years of marriage in. Mm -hmm. uh, so when did you move to Springfield? Moved to Springfield. So what brought that going on? Going back to getting married, we got married July seventh, two thousand twelve. So that following semester of college, I had graduated from Crowder with my associate's degree. Decided I was going to go to Southern uh, Missouri Southern State University in Joplin. So yeah. when I, uh, um, what, what's the word? Not when you get engaged. I don't know. Oh, I don't. I don't know what the word is. But we got engaged. When we got engaged, I told her. I said, "Hey, I'm moving to Joplin to go to continue my schooling." She had a job in Cassville as a certified nurse's assistant. Okay. Um, and she bit that and said, "I'm with you." So that was, ah, you know, that was like a okay. So hey, I'm going to Joplin. I want you to come with me. I'm going to school. I'm going to get my degree. So uh, we went, and um, that's. Where, where, where was where were we going from there? I'm sorry. So uh, uh, you go to you go to Joplin, and yeah. then how was that? Was that to oh, study the, the for to career? Or? Yeah. So I was still up in the air on 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 all that. Um, I I majored in psychology. Okay. So that was what I was going after, and then I was going to minor in cr criminology. You know, so because I knew. I kind of wanted to do law enforcement type deal. Now, had you um, always wanted to do law enforcement since high school? Yeah. So um, I used to love watching cops. You okay. Know? And uh, do you watch the episodes of Springfield? Springfield was kind of oh yeah, Springfield on, was on there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they still they still do that. But uh, I remember sitting with my dad uh, watching cops, and he was like, "Hey, wouldn't it be cool to be a cop? As a matter of fact, wouldn't it be cool to be a state trooper?" So uh, we'll get to that later, but. Um, we would go to Joplin. I continued schooling. Um, so our one year anniversaries, uh, or our, our anniversary is July 7th. We find out we're pregnant that following like November. <laughs> so, so we didn't waste any time. 
uh, getting pregnant. So we get our one year anniversary in July 7th and then Bo is born July 29th of uh, the next year. So, wow. um, you know, it is what it is. And we're scared young parents and, you know, but I stuck, we stuck out the school thing and I worked at Walmart up in Joplin. And um, so what happened was Bo's born July 29th. We start thinking we don't have any family up here. We're, you know, we're kind of worried. We're living in like a fourplex home upstairs with like okay. one exit, you know. So I'm starting to think, well, we got to have like, we need to have a way to get out of here if this thing lights up. So yeah. uh, safety stuff. So we moved to Ozark uh, with her parents. They have a big rental house and moved in with them for about a couple months before we got an apartment. So that's Ozark. I transferred to Missouri State, finished out schooling there. And when I graduated May of 2015, um, I had a psychology degree and uh, minored in criminology. So that, really, and during that last year, I was applying for the Missouri State Arab Patrol. So that's okay. a year, that's a year long process to apply. So w what's the process like if you want to become a state trooper? So it's changed since I went through. It's a lot more streamlined because there's a large recruiting issue going on right now nationwide. So. Um, it was a year long process though when I was doing it. So you had to apply, you had to do a, like a, write up a, a little writing about yourself, do fill out an application with references, that whole thing. And then uh, they, um, you get in for a physical fitness test and like a, just a comprehensive written test. Um, you pass those and then you get okay to schedule a polygraph. So okay. you got to go do a polygraph test. Uh, How is that? In Jeff City. And that's like one of those deals where you feel like the worst human being walking out of there. I got to ask, I don't know if I'm legally allowed to ask, had you ever taken one before? Huh. Okay. No, so, never taken one before. No. Okay. okay. No. So that was literally I mean, the most... I watched it on a Ben Stiller movie, but I, so I think I can, <laughs> I think I could ace it's one. something like that, yeah. but it, you would be surprised. Like it's most, it's just a lot of questions. Like yeah. You're not even hooked up to anything. Okay. You answer a lot of questions and then they hook you up and... Um, they've kind of like gauged what they need to ask you based off of how you answered things. Okay. So then they'll go back and answer questions they think were hot, you know, hot wow. topics when you're hooked up and, um, you know, but you basically make sure you tell every little thing that you've ever done <laughs> to all the way to toilet paper in your neighbor Jack's house, you know, one Halloween night when you're 15 or whatever. So uh, just anything. I mean, I'm talking... So walking out of there, I felt like the worst human being ever. Uh, they're never going to hire me. And what do you know? They scheduled me for an interview. So then you get a, a oral interview. Um, and what's after that? And then you get a conditional officer offer saying after your interview um, for a, like a physical, you get a physical and they do a lot of weird making you like do a standing long jump. And then they, they a lot of, it's like a very extensive physical vision. Um, stuff like that so it's a long process you're like not counting on it you know yeah. um, you're wanting it to work out because you're slotted to graduate and you got a fan you know you now you got a little you know I have a small little family to, to take care of so but it worked out wow you know, it was May 2015 I graduated and I started the Academy July 1st uh, 2015 so. wow it worked out so that's for, so it. what was it like to I mean you remember your first day yeah, yeah. yeah. kind of. It's like yeah. I've purged a lot of that. I've purged <laughs> a lot of that uh, six months. So uh, you go up to Jefferson City to go through their academy, and it's very. It's just a boot. It's kind of like boot camp. And, you know, it's like a. So pair, you're pair a trooper military. going into. Yeah, event. so you're hired. You know, you get the final offer saying you can attend July first, start an academy, in Jeff City at the Higher Patrols Law Enforcement Academy, um, and you're you're salaried at their starting salary. They give you all the equipment, all that. Wow. Oh, that's done. So I thought, I was like, that's cool. And yeah. on top of that, they're going to get me in really good shape. So, uh, <laughs> so, that's you know, benefit. there were people, I mean, there's people showed up that were crying the first day. It's just, it, it, it's a good thing they do it the way that they do it because yeah. if you're not as serious as, you know, you thought you were um, putting in those situations and, you know, it, it gets those people out and makes them realize uh, maybe it's not for me, you know. Yeah. So uh, it was very strenuous paramilitary style for the first, like, probably month or Did so. Did you ever think of quitting? Oh, yeah. yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. I was like, is it worth it? But I kept going back to, hey, they can't kill me, you know, yeah. and, and I'm only getting better. I'm yeah. getting in better shape. And uh, 
I'm getting paid while I'm doing it. So that was that wasn't a bad bad uh, deal. So it always went back to what you know wh- why I wanted to do that you know career. Which and, and why did you? It's not really. So I could say the cliche thing and saying I wanted to help people, but yeah. Uh, before I started the career, it was having a diverse job. Like a, not, I'm not doing the same exact thing every day. I get right. to. You know, I talked to a local trooper there in Cassville. His name's John Lukenhoff. Um, growing up, he was the trooper I kind of looked up to. He was at games and stuff. Yeah. Looked really good in the uniform. Uh, very professional looking. So uh, I talked to him in, early on in college. And uh, he said, hey, the hardest, my hardest decision at the beginning of my day is which way I'm going to pull out of my driveway in my patrol car. Because you take the patrol car home. It's yours. Um, you know, so I thought that's pretty cool. So, so since starting the career like there were like fun parts of the job that I enjoy and yeah. what I enjoy the aspect that I enjoy the most is somebody who's just done like been in the worst situation you know like a crash or for some people just breaking down on the side of the road or a tire blowout and you pull up you just see a car on the shoulder you pull up and they are like wide eyed like don't know what to do and you can just be the calm voice saying hey like I'm here you're fine have you called anybody? Um, what's the plan? And then they kind of calm down. And that's like really satisfying. It's probably yeah. selfish of me to, to be satisfied by that, you know, somebody else's str- you know, struggle or hard hardship. Uh, but just being the calming voice or changing a tire for somebody or, or whatever. It's not like, yeah, arresting bad guys is really fun and uh, get your adrenaline going and stuff. But that's the part of the job that um, always, I always told people, hey, I know it sounds ridiculous, but like I like doing that. I like being the calm voice for people. So now yeah. I don't know if you're legally allowed to talk to this, so just punt if you have to. But what would you say to someone who says they think there's a quota of tickets that you're supposed oh, to write? Yeah, that's non-existent. That's actually a violation of like federal law and state law. If we put you like on a, a polygraph, and you yes, would t- okay, I'll pass, okay, just I'll pass. all right. I continue to like I see that all the time, all the time, and yeah. <clears throat> uh, they uh, that's. That's not the the way things work. So that's the other positive about the job is, I mean, you have the capability to write a ticket or not. And it's like, yeah. you know, but you have to take in all the factors and wow. it's hard to, you know, for some people are going through stuff, but sometimes you hear the same stories over and over and over and over again. And uh, so you kind of have to pick and choose on on how you enforce enforce certain things some things you enforce you just got to do it whether you know like a ddbi or something like it doesn't matter who you are right uh but like registration stuff um seat belts for the patrols the no-go like you gotta have your seat belt on right. um and i've witnessed that on the job and how that protects you uh for sure so so during this season uh young family new career how uh, what was faith a strong part of Part of your daily life. How did how did that play out? Um, from what I can remember, it was a busy season yeah. in terms of that. So I'm trying to learn a new career. Uh, the and this career is something you don't just learn all the facts and you go out there and do it. You come across something new every day. You yeah. know, it's pretty wild, wild world. So um, learning that, you know, it may have taken away from that time a little bit. But her parents are really good and re- are continue to be really good for when we fall short on that, they are always willing to say, hey, let us pick up the grandkids, we'll take them to our church. So we have, you know, they have grandma and grandpa's church and then, you know, when we're really hitting yeah. it, you know what I mean? So that was early, the early on in the career, I would say that it was tough. I mean, yeah. worldly stuff going on and uh, we lived uh, – South Springfield, but we were trying to, we were actively trying to, we, we knew we needed to find a church. Like, yeah. We need to find a church. We need to find somewhere where we love to go, uh, where the kids love to go and, you know, and, and that we get, um, we do that because that's very important. How did you connect to North Point? Did you know people there? So that was later on. Um, so Jessica, fast forwarding, um, Jessica got a, so she worked at Mercy when we, I got a, a career, you know, when I started with the patrol, she worked at Mercy. And then uh, through the patrol, a guy I worked with, his wife worked for this uh, insurance company where she works now. And she actually, she met uh, Jared Davis yeah. uh, there. And uh, J- Jared's North Point 
guy. And he, so, he's a favorite of many of our listeners. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so Jared, Jared's, Jared's my boy. So, uh, she's, she went and she had a friend that went there too, that loved it. So we started going there and, yeah. uh, the Nixa campus and, um, continue to and love Brad it. Fox didn't scare you back in those Brad days. Fox didn't scare, you know, no. Nope. So, <laughs> uh, it was, it was, you know, not what we were used to in terms of being a satellite, you know what I mean? Like, right. a, like a satellite uh, deal, but, um, we've grown to love it. So it's, that's awesome. That's awesome. It's great. So, um, you know, we all have big challenges that we go through. Mm -hmm. What's unique about yours is, um, plays out on a pretty public stage. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about, you know, one of the uh, exciting parts is never knowing what's going to happen in your day. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about, uh, you know, what, what was your uh, kind of constant awareness of the danger of your job and then kind of walk us through the, the big event yeah. that you went through. Uh, I don't know how uh, uncorked you want me to be on that, but... Uh, ultimately, you know, you're trained to, you know, you got to be prepared for everything on a traffic stop or helping somebody on the side of the road who's got to blow out or, you know, strain a motorist. How um, often so, did you feel like, you know, in your many years of doing that, how often did you feel like this is dangerous right now? Uh, oh, very often. Okay. Enough to where I can, you know, count, you know what I mean? Tell yeah. you I've been in this many situations. Early on, yeah. Like I used to remember everybody I arrested, everybody, you know, every time that I had to pull a gun out or whatever, um, you know, I used to be able to tell you all that stuff, but it's kind of like it over time, you just, it happens so often and you get used to it. Uh, you just really got to like decompress. Um, and faith is a good, good way to de decompress, um, exercise, stuff like that. So, um, but in just terms of being prepared for that, you got to be prepared for the worst all the time, whether you're dealing with grandma on a, yeah. <laughs> that's got a lead foot, uh, or, <laughs> or whatever. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's very, very, uh, it could be taxing if you're was, not. Was uh, Jessica, was she, uh, would you guys talk about that a lot? Yeah, yeah. and, and that, that's, that was important to me because some wives don't, you know, want to hear that stuff. They yeah. don't want to hear about the pursuits that you get into or the, you know, the, uh, you know, the gun you pull off somebody. But she was very, she was very supportive. And yeah. I think that's important to be able to come home and talk about some, some, some guys and girls don't get to come home and tell anybody. They just kind of just keep it inside and they're not able to say, hey, this is what I did today. Yeah. So she was always down to listen and she understood the dangers of the job and uh, she just, she knew that, you know, I trusted my training and she trusted that, you know, and prayed a lot. <laughs> so yeah. uh, she was very supportive in all aspects of the career choice. Believe me, she had to give me the okay to, to do that career, by the way. Yeah. I was like, hey, I'm going to drop on and I'm going to be a state trooper. I, it was more like, hey, I'm going to go drop and get a degree. Right. I might work for Walmart or something in management, but she she knew what I wanted to do and um, she was uh, yeah. very supportive of that. So, Tell us a little bit about the day a lot of, a lot of these uh, elements of life changed. Uh, after, would you, like, yeah, tell us about you know uh, the, the day of the, the incident that you had yeah, yeah. and so, um, as far as, you know, uh, Kind of, kind of in a nutshell, what happened yeah. and what did you do after that? Yeah, so about seven, I was like going on a little over seven months ago. Uh, I was, it was a Friday night, December 10th. Uh, I was going, actually on my way home. I was due off at 11 o'clock at night. I was off all weekend, was going to go to a football game that weekend. Mm. Uh, In-laws were at the house. Uh, so I was a couple miles from home, exited off the highway to at Glenstone and um, a truck just, I was, I got a green light, started going, a truck just blows a red light right in front of me. So um, regular traffic, you know, deal. I thought, I just tell this guy, hey, what, you need to pay attention to the light or whatever. Um, get out and he takes off in the car. So Chase is on. Um, long story short, it ends where he wrecks out in some woods. I'm trying to affect the arrest and I get shot with a, a 20 gauge shotgun, uh, bird shot. So ended up, um, losing my eye, my right eye, uh, because of it. And it was just a very unnerving event because while it was happening, you know, I knew what happened. I had, I was conscious and, 
you know, I was able to re- return fire and do my job and protect myself and try to uh, stop what he was doing, which is, you know, ultimately trying to kill me. Yeah. So, uh, but in that, you know, during that vent, I actively remember thinking, man, this is happening and, you know, am I right, you know, in faith? Am I, is my family going to be okay, you know, without me? Or if, 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 because I didn't, I couldn't tell you when it happened, hell, that's a 20 gauge shotgun bird shot. You know, I right. thought I got shot through it. I knew the pressure was right here. I thought I got shot in the eye and it's in my head and I don't know how long I'm going to last here. So, uh, there was a lot of unknowing there, but training, you know, and, mm. you know, thank God that I had, you know, the audacity to get up out of there and, uh, it was down in a steep ravine. I was able to run back up and meet the responding officers and uh, get to the hospital while they did their thing on scene. So um, my, wow. w- my wife was there like that. At what point do you, do you call her? How does that? So on the way to the hospital, it was actually another trooper that uh, transported me. Um, I remember saying, Jessica's going to be ticked. Yeah. Because I was, she, you know, over the years, she, she knows, hey, you're coming home. We have plans. Do not stop a car. Turn your blinders on, you know. But when you're out there, your, your job never stops. Um, so I thought, she's going to be so mad at me. I <laughs> stopped this car and turned into this. And now she's going to have to go to the hospital and look at me. But, uh, and now I'm even uglier than I was before. <laughs> before. So uh, I was very, you know, so. It, they worked it out to where she got contacted, went to the hospital with her dad, actually, and her sister. Uh, the kids were able to stay. It just worked out God's timing in terms of my in-laws being at the house. Staying. They yeah. just called up and said, hey, we're going to stay the night. And wow. her sister stayed there. So uh, mother-in-law stayed with the kids, and she was able to come to uh, the hospital with her dad and sister. And they cleaned me up the best they could and, uh, before I started getting treat, you know, surgery and stuff. And she was able to come in there and talk to me. And I, I said, sorry. I told her, sorry. Like, you know, uh, didn't make it home tonight. Tonight, So uh, she obviously told me to shut my mouth. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> you're still here. So that's all that matters. But she's uh, mm. she's been, she's always been my rock. And she continues to be my rock through that. So um, at what point in that process did you know, okay, I think I'm going to make it. I think I'm going to survive this thing. So, I mean, I walked into the hospital like, Okay. I thought that's a pretty good thing. So I was thinking, I knew I had a headache and I had seen in the reflection of the trooper that transported me, his car on scene. I was, cause it was, they were covering the vehicle and I was looking at myself and I could see, I knew my eye was gone. Cause I remember being out there trying to shut my, or I shut my left eye and it was just black. So I knew my eyes not good. Um, but at that point I thought, okay, it was birdshot or something, glass, whatever, uh, that hit me. So, um, from there I go, um, to the hospital and I, I walked in and, you know, I thought no, I'm not going to pass out or anything. So I'm not losing a whole lot of blood. So I knew that there wasn't, and I was thinking cognitively thinking. So I knew that from there it was going to be, it was bad in terms of probably losing my eye, but you yeah. know, I'm still here. I'm going to be able to see my kids, you know, eventually see my wife. So, uh, went into surgery and they tried to save it, but, uh, the on-call ophthalmologist did the best he could and it was just, you know, not, not in the cards. So what's been that process since then, as far as uh, rehab and recovery, I mean, seven months, seven months in, mm-hmm. uh, how difficult has that been? It, it was difficult just with the vision alone. Um, honestly, if I hadn't been hit in the eye, I think I'd, I would have been back, you know, within a, a month, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, but the eye thing, you know, it throws in a whole lot of problems because um, just getting used to seeing with one eye every day, it was very tiring. You know, yeah. your eye has to, it's like your eye is getting a lot of overtime. So um, that as well as, you know, the cosmetic stuff and not knowing where different pieces are inside. They didn't take anything out. I mean, they just left it all in there. So really? they thought, hey, it's not in any vital areas, so we'll leave it and they'll fester out when they fester out. And they have. They've come out of my shoulder, my face, and my mouth. Um, so it was a long process in terms of like deciding, first and foremost, deciding to, to take my eye. I had to like, it was either we're going to do a lot of surgeries over the next year 
and you might be able to see shadows. Um, but there's this other thing called uh, sympathetic ophthalmia that can take the eye, vision of the other eye because you're it's trying to compensate and it, you can lose vision in your, your eye that's left. So hmm. that was an easy decision at that point because I was like, it was like 50-50 that it could happen. And I thought, right. I'm not going to take the chance of not being able to see my kids grow up and see my wife. So that was a decision I had to make. Um, and so that was the toughest part of the whole thing was yeah. take my eye out. Um, so after that was taken out, it was night. I mean, it was great. I felt good like three days afterwards. And at that point, it was just healing scars and getting used yeah. to having one eye. So when you have kids, that was um, a positive um, in terms of rehab because they like to throw stuff at me all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was a lot of ball throwing and um, tracking and yeah. stuff like that. So uh, the therapist, the occupational therapist said that that's the best um, rehab you're going to get is from your kids every day, yeah. you know? So that's what we <laughs> did, man. We just play catch and we still do. And uh, they ended up saying that it was, you know, it really wasn't a factor in terms of keeping me from doing anything that anybody else can do, driving. Yeah. Um, so anyways, that that was the hardest part was adjusting to the one eye thing. Um, and... Uh, but for my family was the fact that, you know, what are you going to do now? You right. know, what, what's, what's the next step? So I knew that I wanted to be able to continue to do the work I was doing. Cause that's, I'm vested and, uh, you know, it's, I didn't want to have to learn something new. And I yeah. go back to the reason I wanted to do the job is cause it was different. You know, you do something different every day. And, um, so that was a decision I made was if I can get cleared, I'll come back. Um, and so that was tough for the family to be like, okay, uh, all right, you know, and so be, yeah. be supportive of that after something like that. So um, fast forward a couple months, um, my agency's trying to, you know, scavenger around to say, because you know, they've never came across something like this. So yeah. uh, put me through a whole lot of things in terms of seeing different specialists and, and stuff. And finally, ultimately got, they said, hey, you're still a trooper. You're, you're back on this date. So uh, I was able to request some things, request a transfer to the criminal unit, the criminal investigations unit. I get to dress like this, yeah. uh, drive an unmarked vehicle. Um, I just decided that probably the patrol, you know, the uniformed patrol type deal, the same, working the same aspect I was when that happens, probably the best for the family, um, family's well being. Um, so. Uh, it's been great. I've been doing it since May 22nd. So coming back in May, uh, yeah. was that just surreal? Yeah. And I had been on light duty I, since like February. So okay. I had been like coming to troop. So time out. You get shot in the yeah. face yeah. in December. Yeah. Surgery to remove your eye, yep. therapy, yep. and back in February. Yep. So I got the prosthetic eye at the end of January. And like after that, I was like, hey, I can come back. I can come in. I'm not, I mean, it's not going to be hard to look at me anymore, you know, because it was like they had like a little pink thing in there um, or uh, kind of like a contact thing because there's exposed tissue and stuff. So it looked nasty. So, and I didn't like wearing the patch. I was like, I'm not wearing a patch. I'm not going to be like, uh, you know, a pirate or, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I started light duty and was able wow. to do administrative work at Troop. And then, uh, during that, um, the criminal guys were like able to uh, incorporate me into what they were doing, paperwork, administrative work, to kind of like become familiar with that aspect, yeah. and it worked out good for when I requested the transfer, and they were they were all about it. So, how uh, did you did you have any uh, faith epiphanies during this season? And no pressure that you did, but you know, going through this, um, what was your your background of knowing there's a God and Making a commitment to him, and then going through this dark season. How did how did that play out for you? Um, well, throughout my faith journey, like the, the the epiphanies that I've had with my faith was that through all the good times, bad times, like God's always there with you, like right over your yeah. shoulder with you during those times. And you, you know, whether you're looking at it as a present time or um, in the past, looking at it and you know a long time ago, you yeah. think he was with me 
because I'm still here and I'm still able to, uh, you know, do what, do what I want to do or do what I'm doing. Um, so through my faith journey, I've realized that. So this was like a big, no pun intended, like no, you know, pun intended. This is a big eye opener. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> you said it, I did. Yeah. So uh, big eye opener um, on, you know, it being like he was with me during that incident and before. And uh, wow. so, so I had, there was no faith lost. If not, if, I mean, there, it was gained, you know, more mm. than anything. Cause um, uh, you, know, you pr- during your shifts, like during my shifts, I pray, you know, you may, yeah, I may pray every now and then. It's, I don't have like a set schedule, but right. every now and then you think, yeah, hey, <laughs> I'm, I, uh, you know, love you and you know I, you know um forgive me from sins and and stuff like that uh so i i uh i thought you know was i had i prayed that shift you know what i mean you go back and think had i prayed right. that shift uh, am i am i right you know so you you have your you look back at situations like that and you wonder if you're in the right place but like it definitely opened me up to saying hey i need to make sure i'm always right yeah. Um, and it's just been, it's been great in terms yeah. of building that, uh, up and, uh, kids for the kids as well. Um, yeah. cause that's, that's important. Um, so the kids, the kids still love going to church and, um, I had that talk with them. There wasn't really any, there was some filter there, but I mean, I, I look like, uh, what's the guy from the Goonies? Uh, hey, yes. you got, I mean, I look, I don't know swollen, his name, but I know exactly, but I looked horrible when I got home. So they knew something was up. So we had to tell them. So, yeah. uh, but being able to incorporate that to them in terms of, you know, God protect me, protected me. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I hope that they, they got something out of that and they've been doing great since. Yeah. So, uh, how much, uh, you know, I mean, it's a personal question. How much battle do you have of harboring? Hate and bitterness. <laughs> yeah, I've been asked that question uh, uh, not too long ago. Um, you know, it's still tough. You know, it's yeah. still tough to not hold hold a grudge. And I may come to that. You know, hopefully, I come to that sooner than later. Obviously, um, there's things like the case, ongoing case right. going on, and you know, um, you think about all the things that. You know, I wanted to do my career, how I wanted to promote and um, continue to work in that road aspect. And, um, but then you think, well, that sounds pretty self, you know, you you don't want to sound selfish or seem selfish. Um, So a lot of prayer and, uh, you know, talking to the kid, you know, just talking to my kids is a lot of, a lot of it too, you know, because they've asked that too, you know, Mm. where's where's the bad guy at, you know? Yeah. uh, so we just tend to try not to talk about it, but about the bad guy, but, uh, you know, I'm not, I mean, I'll be honest. I'm not, you know, I'm not there right now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I continue to pray about it and, um, my wife continues to pray about it. She's right there with me, if not a little more, you know, a little more, uh, affected by it. So yeah, I, uh, you know, that's just something that's going to take, take us, you know, look at so you, right. you bringing it up is like a good reminder too so you, t- you tend to like block that out yeah but it's it's important it's an important aspect of this whole thing to to look at well i i uh, am so thankful that uh, god's been with your family from even before you were a family mm-hmm. and and through the most challenging time and then to know man you've got such a future ahead. And I do pray God's best blessings on you, your family. And I'm so, uh, I respect so much your commitment to serve this community. And even, I mean, you have the classic, not the you have you have the most unarguable out if you wanted to, to say, hey, I've done my duty. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll let someone else serve now and I'll do something different. And for you to say, all right, let me back at it. Let me serve. Uh, so much respect. You will never pay for a Waffle House if I'm in that Waffle House <laughs> as long as I live. I love <laughs> Waffle House, man. It's, I like that greasy, 
greasy <laughs> eggs. That's good. Well, thank you so much for sharing your journey. And I know it's it's fresh, it's raw. As a as a North Pointer, I hope anybody listening is just encouraged to say, man, is uh is, is God's with us. It doesn't mean life's gonna be easy, but it means life's never gonna be alone. And and I pray you continue to find that to be true. And thank you for being with us in the riff and and blessings on you, my friend. The thank pride you. of Caspel, <laughs> the trout, the fighting trout. Yeah. So yeah. thanks hey, for having me. Thanks so much, Colton. Yeah. All right. Thanks again for listening to another episode of the riff. I hope you're encouraged. May God use Colton's story. Uh, to speak to you about your own story and you're never alone. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Riff. Submit a question for the podcast at northpointchurch.tv slash podcast. We'll have a brand new episode every week wherever you find podcasts.